What's up everyone, Darkscream217 here, and this is going to be another big manga vlog, but it's probably not going to be as big as Negima's. I actually want to keep this one a little short because, well, it's basically talking about a series that most people are very, very familiar with anyways. And I'm not going to like, I'm probably going to bring up some pieces of information and trivia and stuff, but I'm not going to like go into detail on what this series is. Because again, this is something, you know, people are familiar with, or uh, for the most part. And as you can tell from the title and some of the images here, I'm going to be talking about uh, Sailor Moon again. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about the manga, which includes 12 volumes. I may talk a little bit about Codename Sailor V again, and I'm even going to briefly mention the short story compilations, which is about two volumes of... And the most recent one, Volume 2, came out, you know, November of last year. Which is convenient timing because that one contains a very long uh, story arc, the Princess Kaguya arc. Which lasts about more than like, I'm going to say about four-fifths of the manga anyways. And the whole storyline takes place during, you know, Christmas season. So, and I am recording this vlog on Christmas Eve. I don't know if I'm going to get this out tomorrow or the following day, but I am trying to get this out, you know, uh, by the holidays, because, you know, I just think of it as a minor Christmas present to my fans, I mean, I did say I was going to review, uh, say, uh, not review, but did, I did say I was going to talk about Sailor Moon, and I do plan on doing that, now, um, I've mentioned in the past, in a couple videos, that I am a fan of the series, it's one of the first anime I've seen when I was a kid, this was something I grew up with, and back in 2011, or maybe they've done this late 2010, I can't remember specifically when the news announcement was made, but I've heard from Anime News Network that Kodansha Comics, who also have the rights to um, to Negima now, I heard that they were planning on re-releasing Sailor Moon, almost in its uncut, pure, translated format, as well as the other two volumes of Sailor V. When I first heard that news, I got really excited. I really wanted to read this manga for a long time. I know there have been scanlations out there, but I'm really not fond of reading scanlations because uh, I just like the idea of, you know, holding a book into my hand. Now, I have nothing against digital reading material, material that comes from Nooks or Kindlers. I think that's a great idea. And maybe I'll owe myself a little tablet that's specifically for reading shit. But... The, uh, but I just like the idea of just holding the book in the hand and just, you know, holding it, uh, uh, checking out, like, holding it, like, you, you know, I just, I just, I'm just that much of a traditionalist. But before this, I believe Tokyo Pop had the license, or they were known as some company, uh, some other company before, but it was, um, it was as edited as much as you think it would be. Um, it read from le uh, left to right in, you know, Western comic book format instead of the uh, other way around, which is right to left, which is what most manga is basically being released as now. And I know that's a really bizarre way of reading things, but um, but I actually started reading Chobits and Excel Saga. That, those were like the first manga I've read. And you get used to it real quick. I mean, as long as you can read it, and you can... Uh, it doesn't matter how you read it. I mean, you could do, you can like, you can have the book flipped upside down. As long as I can see the pictures and the image and the dialogue uh, play specifically, all that shit. Of course I can read it. But anyways, Sailor Moon. Uh, I, I think it was edited a little bit. Um, certain character names were changed, but they were trying to keep faithful to the original, uh, to the, to the original source material, like. Usagi Sakino was not named Serena like she was in the anime. I believe they called her Bunny, uh, which what her name means anyways. But other than that, I did not know much about the um, the the, the uh, previous release version of uh, Sailor Moon because I never really picked up and read it. Uh, there was I don't even think there was an opportunity uh, for me to read it because it was out of print um, when. Uh, uh, when I just started getting around to reading manga, or at least I believe it was. 
And I don't think Sailor V has been localized before, and I've been curious to check that out when I found out it was basically the prototype or the starting grounds that, uh, that helped create Sailor Moon, because before Sailor Moon, there was Sailor V, Sailor Venus, you know, Monaco. She was the first uh, hero, he, she was actually the first hero to be shown. But then, of course, the, the story got changed a little uh, to be more of a team base, and there was a protagonist shift. Uh, traits were pretty similar uh, between Usagi and Monaco, but one difference is that um, Usagi was a was a bit more immature, and she even called herself a crybaby sometimes uh, at times. Now, in comparison to the anime, and I know I said I was going to talk specifically about the manga, but most people know what the anime is, and you know had their first experience that way. Um, is it better? Than the anime, I would say, yeah, there were a lot of things I liked over the anime, and, uh, but there were also some things I really didn't, uh, that I, I just, well, I kind of missed from, uh, from my experience in the anime. For starters, most of the villains don't get, uh, huge amounts of development. Not, not, not just the monsters of the weeks, but the, but the higher ranking dudes, uh, in each, uh, villain group. Like the Dark Kingdom, um, Jedi, Nephrite, Zoisite, and Kunzite, uh, they don't get a whole lot of scre- uh, uh, time. Scre- well, I would let, let's just say page time presence. They don't get as much in the manga um, as they do as they do get screen time in the anime, and they do get they do get taken care of pretty quickly. In fact, most of the most of those villains who are like in those general ranks do get they get taken out pretty quickly. It's almost insane, really. But I believe Jedi existed for like three chapters. Then they introduced Sailor Mars. And she freaking burns him to a mummified corpse. And that's that's all we see. Uh, that, that, I, don't, I wouldn't say that's all we hear from him. Because they do reveal that his backstory is that he used to work. Uh, he used to serve under Endymion. Who is also known as Tuxedo Mask. Or his civilian identity, Mamoru Chiba. As well as the other three generals were like that. But yeah, he, he just gets taken... I was surprised on how quick he got taken out of. And same thing with Nephrite. Um, they had an extra chapter before they introduced Sailor Jupiter. Uh, there was... Um, but then when they introduced Sailor Jupiter, um, Makoto Kino, she just takes out Nephrite pretty quickly, j- as fast as Sailor Mars did with her lightning attack. Um, that was a huge stark contrast to how they handled Nephri in the anime. In the anime, uh, he actually got some interesting development, and he ended up being a love interest for one of Yusaki's friends, Naru, and he ends up dying a pretty sad death. Um, yeah, a a lot of things happened with him, and he was actually my favorite of the four villain generals, too. But, yeah, that that was it. Uh, it it is pretty fast-paced. I mean, the first story arc, the Dark Kingdom arc, it only lasts two and a half volumes. Then we go to the uh, the Black Moon arc, which, you know, it introduces um, Chibiusa, Usagi's, do- uh, Usagi's daughter, and, uh, you know, they start coming in, and that also lasts two and a half volumes. And, yeah, uh, it, like, like I said, it, it's pretty quick, which it may be good for some people. There's not a whole lot of filler. Things don't drag. Um, you don't have to deal deal with a whole lot of goofy monster of the weeks vil- type villains. They're kind of laughably stupid. I mean, they started off pretty menacing in the anime first, but then they got really goofy, especially when they introduced the rainbow monsters, which you would think they would be menacing from when you hear about their backstory, but they're also kind of ridiculous. But one of the positives on Sailor Moon being a little more fat, uh, being way faster paced than the anime is that they don't really dwell on a whole lot of filler, and as a result, characters aren't as flanderized or their negative traits don't come out as much, and as a result, I was able to tolerate them more. For example, I remember in the anime, Rei and Usagi, at least in the first story arc, they they, uh, sh- they were just they they just insulted the shit out of each other, almost as if they generally did dislike each other. Which contradicts the purpose of their team. In the anime, however, not in the anime. In the manga, however, part of my mistake. Um, nah, that shit's practically non-existent. I don't recall a single situation like that. In fact, in one of the short stories, she basically 
got in conflicts more with Monaco uh, than she did with Usagi. Another thing I liked is I was able to tolerate Chibiusa more than I could in the anime. In the anime, she was kind of, not kind of, she was pretty annoying. Um, did not like her at all. She came off as bratty, kind of gotten away in a lot of things. You know, she's a kid. Whenever you introduce a kid character, especially one like mid-season, you, you, you don't want to screw up on that. Otherwise, she might become the most vile, you know, piece of crap in that thing um in the in whatever you're writing but in this anime i don't know if i could say i like her but again i tolerated her a little more even though there were some interesting revelations about her she's still from the future from crystal tokyo which is basically ruled by neo queen serenity which is future usagi or future sailor moon and her uh, husband is still tuxedo mask but now he's known as king endymion Sorry, um, whenever I talk, I like to get a little fast pace, and I forget that I have to breathe when I talk. <laughs> Excuse me a second. Well, one thing about Chibiusa is that she is actually 900 years old, which is, which, you know, kind of fuzzles me. Um, they mentioned specifically that she, for some reason, can't age, and she actually, you know, got bullied for it, and they showed in some of flashback scenes of her. And I, even if she hasn't grown a bit, I think it's weird that she has a childish personality at 900 years old. You would think you would be like a super wise man at that area. What the fuck did she do in her life all the time? Like it's almost she did nothing for 900 years and that would probably, God, it would make more sense if she was in a frozen sleep or something. Um, that part really confuzzled me. Now, I don't know if that was in the anime or not. I like my, my, my memory of the anime is pretty hazy. Uh, I only remember stuff from the first season because I, you know, watched that recently, but you know, Sailor Moon's art through stars. I don't have much of a memory on anymore. And she, unfortunately, before she was known as Chibi Usa, she, she liked to call herself after her mother, Yusagi Sakino, but then they just, uh, but I, I think she got the name Chibi Usa from, I can't remember if it was from Usagi or Usagi's mom, but before that, she was mostly known as Small Lady, and that's kind of demeaning, actually, kind of dickish, or at least that's how Kodansha translated her name, and... And it also, it like, it also results in her, like, because she was a never a able to physically age, she ends up being manipulated by, you know, the villain in a true traditional Sith Lord way, as she ends up, while she ends up uh, looking older in appearance, she now, like, sides with the black, uh, she side with, sided with the Black Moon, and now she calls herself Black Lady. Um... I don't know what else to say about her. Uh, she has gotten a lot of focus, but it was nowhere near as bad as um, Sailor Moon Super S in the anime. And I'll cover a little bit about that story arc uh, later. But again, like I didn't, uh, I did really did not hate her as much. Um, I know she's not. I know I'm not the only one who has that opinion. Apparently, she's commonly reviled among Sailor Moon fans. At least here in the West, they are. I want to talk about a little bit about the villains, uh, um, the villains in the manga. Uh, they all have a very similar formulaic pattern, uh, from the way they are ranked to some of their motivations, and it actually, it's actually um, how the plots are structured. Um, most people, uh, it is the story, the the story and actions are repetitive, like they are in the anime. They do have a formula to them. Uh, main, it, it's not as bad as the anime because you don't have any filler monster of the week villains, but it, it, you, you can see how everything, but you can guess the outcome of every chapter, um, for the most part. See, the villains are, you got some weak, weak level monsters that show up only to, you know, do their thing and then they get killed by either Sailor Moon or they or one of the uh, Sailor Guardians, and that's what they're called in the series. The Sailor uh, in the manga, they're called the Sailor Guardians. Um, Sailor Moon is actually Bishoujo Senshi Sailor Moon. They translate it as Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. So 
Yeah, that's what they. That's what I'm going to refer to them from now on. I know they've been called the Sailor Scouts, Sailor Senshi, Sailor Warriors, and even Sailor Soldiers. Take your pick, whatever. I don't give a damn. But I'm just going to refer to them as the Guardians. But anyways, the villains show of uh, the the minor villains show up, cause some havoc, uh, steals energy, makes people turn into riotous monsters, whatever. Sailor Scouts spot the enemy, fight it very quickly, dispose of it, and um, they keep doing this until they run out of general, <laughs> run out of those weaklings. And then once that happens, some big revelation is made regarding that story arc. Uh, the Dark Moon Kingdom, uh, the very first story arc, is that everyone got memories of their past lives, and they saw what happened. They 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 used to be a Moon Kingdom a long time ago. So Queen Beryl uh, uh, of Earth invaded. Um, uh, Prince Endymion prote- tried to protect uh, uh, Princess Serenity at the time. He dies. She takes her life with the sword. And then they get reincarnated, blah, blah, blah. They uh, The whole objective in the first story arc was to gather the other Sailor Guardians and locate the princess. And they also locate the legendary Silver Crystal. Uh, which is one, which is actually the driving force behind a lot of things in this an, uh, in this manga. Most villains seek it for its power or seek to destroy it, and and the, the basically that thing is that thing is like a super. It, it's a superpower jewel. It's supposed to be like restoring life and shit. It's pretty OP, and I can see why villains seek to either obtain it themselves. And try to use it for evil or just just flat out destroy it themselves. But anyways, yeah. After the after the minor villains are taken out, or at least most of them are taken out, then some revelations happen. Then they have a big epic fight with some of their higher ranking uh, dudes. And then they fight the big, big, big villain of the story arcs. Which is basically some monster that's obscured in shadows and even talks and... Whenever, uh, whenever the villain talks, the font like goes to this creepy, skinny font. I don't know what the font speci- uh, called specifically, but they just go to like a weird, creepy looking font whenever they talk, just to make them more ominous. And then a big fight with the uh, ultimate villains, and sometimes they may get a new power power up or transformation. Sailor Moon defeats it. And they all live happily ever after until immediately something else uh, shows up. Um, Queen Beryl, even though she was like the most prolific villain and most people remember her, she really wasn't the top villain in that arc. It was uh, Queen Metallia that was. She uh, Beryl was just following orders from her. Um, the Dark Moon, ki- uh, not, not Dark Moon, Black Moon um, had like... Uh, that one I kind of that set of villains um I really don't like but the ultimate villain uh I thought that was a really interesting revelation. Um the Black Moon is basically a group of rebels from 30th century C- Crystal Tokyo that went and attacked Crystal Tokyo. Everyone's uh almost every citizen is kind of effed up. Uh Sailor Moon's like in a crystal coffin and I think King Endymion is there, or maybe he's doing some... I can't remember specifically if he was physically there, or he was basically pulling some uh, Jor-El shit uh, regarding King Endymion, because they because they, set, they, they establish a rule, and it's not really that much of a strict rule, because they end up breaking it at the end of the series, that their past lives cannot meet with their future lives because, as Doc Brown would put it, it would just cause a crazy collapse in the time-space continuum. But at the end of the chapter, I, uh, uh, Usagi uh, contacts Neo Queen Serenity anyways. So, psh. But the Black Moon decided to go back to, to, tw- to the 20th century and just cause havoc there so they can rewrite history. Um... And uh, Chibiusa, it was uh, actually sh- uh, showed up around around the same time, so she could get her hands on the legendary silver crystal. That's what they were looking for too. Uh, and there were two legendary silver crystals: one that uh, Usa took, Chibiusa took herself from the future, and the one they currently have after finding it in the uh, Dark Kingdom arc. And 
like, like I said, it pl- it played out uh, the st- the stories and million chapters played out as you expected, but um, when they when they int- when they make a the twist about the uh, main villain, the Death Phantom, he was once some dude that caused some havoc some time ago in the future setting, and Neo Queen Serenity banished him on the on planet Nemesis. Which is also the same name of the pa- planet of uh, of where Witch Bandor from Koryu Sentai Zero Ranger was uh, uh, imprisoned. You may know her as Rita Repulsa, but that, that's where else she was. Uh, that's the same name of the planet. I don't know if uh, Tekauchi, you know, draw that from inspiration or the other way around. But I thought that was a really interesting, um, interesting coincidence. But anyways, um... The Black Moon Rebels themselves, uh, they were following order. Uh, they they were following advice from some creepy dude in the cloak known as the Wise Man. Uh, when Prince Demand, uh, I don't know if, the, if it's pronounced Demande or Demand, it's spelled D E M A N D E. Uh, so I'm just gonna call him Demande. So when Demande got a little suspicious of Wise Man, he attacks him, and it turns out it was just some you know skeleton bones. It was a decoy. It turns out the Death Phantom, uh, with the help of this anti-legendary silver crystal called the Malefic Black Crystal, it turns out he was able to fuse himself with the planet. The Death Phantom was planet nemesis itself. And I thought that was a really interesting twist, to say the least. In that same story arc, they actually introduced Sailor Pluto. And a lot of people are probably going to crack jokes and mention the fact that because scientists claim that Pluto is not a planet anymore, she may may not even exist in the upcoming reboot. Now, or uh, whatever anime ad- uh, adaptation that's supposed to be coming out, uh, coming out around this time, if it comes out, I'm having doubts that it will come out at all. They said we were supposed to get some kind of information or uh, or it should be starting to broadcast sometime around the, the November to January window. Well, it's almost the end of December. That window is fucking closing and closing pretty fast. And I'm actually expecting them to make another delay announcement or just a flat out cancellation. I know that's pessimistic, but my God... Stop with the blue ball in me, man. Either have an anime adaptation of Sailor Moon or not. Please, don't don't have this big what if, maybe if attitude with me. That ticks me off because it just reminds me of Media Blasters at this point. But anyways, if it does happen to come out, which will be great, and I hope it does. I hope I'm, uh, uh, um, if it does, I'm pretty sure Sailor Pluto would still be pretty relevant for two reasons. One, they actually kind of reveal later at the end of the series that there's just other sailor guardians all over the fucking milky way galaxy some of them are named after planets in the galaxy and some of them are actually just stars or or named after asteroids i believe or some shit like that they kind of make this this obvious at the end of the uh the dream arc which is what super s's anime got adapted from um so, yeah, there's going to be a Sailor Pluto. Second thing, if they cut her out and they try to make it faithful to the manga, that's going to cause a lot of problems. She is the reason she is the reason how she is why Chibiusa can go back and forth in time. Chibiusa is friends with Sailor Pluto. She was actually her only friend. And Sailor Pluto's job is basically just to guard the time space door. Um and, yeah, she, they need her for the time travel if they're going to cover the Black Moon arc. And, because of her, there's a reason why Sailor Chibi Moon exists. She basically, um, she had three strict rules in the in Kodansha. I know some people criticize the translation. I don't have a whole lot of problems with the translations. I know it's a few F-ups here and there. But, this is just a little nitpick. They show her flashbacking from Neo Queen Serenity's orders, not to, not to break three rules, but they call it three taboos. So I'm like, oh, just call it rules. Why say taboos? But anyway, she was like, she was always to sit here and you know sit in that time space door. She is to like never aid anyone else, and the biggest one, which is what caused her death, 
but then she gets revived anyways in uh in the third arc so but her third rule was she was never allowed to you know use her time freeze power that would just instantly take her out she needed to use it to prevent prince demand from merging the two silver crystals together because it might because of some because it would cause some catastrophic event he had some trust issues with both uh the death phantom and he really despises you know sailor moon and the others so there was really no full face turn for that guy so she uses the uh, time freeze get the crystals back but then she dies and when now the now evil black lady sees her die she gets upset because that was, you know, her uh, her only friend, and that causes her little guardian powers to awaken, and there's Sailor Chibi Boon. So she's kind of relevant for that story arc, to say the least, and she stays being relevant uh, for a while, too. Let me take this time to do a little mini rant about Volume 5 of the manga specifically, which is the conclusion of the Black Moon arc. Now... The arc itself, the way it's written, I have no issues against it. Strong conclusion. In fact, if it were to end there, it would have ended a little, it would have ended just fine. Uh, had the series not continued on. Well, save for the last few pages where Chibius is like, uh, but goodbye, I'm going to the future. She goes to the future, 10 seconds later, she comes back, she gets a letter from Neo Queen Severity saying, oh, thank you for taking, for having her train as a guardian. And Usagi's a little ticked off about that. Because she's been a huge... Can you say cock block for a woman? Well, she's blocking something for her, that's for sure. The issue I had with Volume 5 was that, oh my god, the person who printed this or something must have happened in the factory where it was printed because my pages got smudged to shit. Most of the text was completely unreadable Things were, were looked blurry as hell, and one of the chapter pages, the one uh, I think it was like Act Twenty Three or Act Twenty Five, it, it's a full page splash of all the uh, inner Sailor Guardians and Sailor Moon herself. The 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 right page had Sailor Mars's you know body completely obscured by black ink. Um. I thought it was weird, so I decided to look it up, and it turns out they have smudged a few copies. And keep in mind, I bought volumes 3 through 12. Oh my god, am I developing a fucking cold now? I bought volumes 3 through 12 online about a month ago. So they still have copies of this roaming around. Um, but... I did find a copy of Volume Five at my local bookstore, and it turns out that th that that the the smudge problem uh, is dealt with. So now I have two copies of Volume Five because of that BS, and I just like I don't have an issue with the translation, but my God, that should have that should have been a recall or something. I know they say I know it's supposed to be for like defective products, but God damn, that was just. That was unprofessional, and it totally let my guard down, you know. I The way they were handling um, Sailor Moon up until that point, I was like, yeah, okay, Every, everyone's a little bit competent. Yeah, translator sucks a few times, but uh, but as long, hey, at least I'm reading the actual un, uh, uncut Sailor Moon. Well, jeez Louise, man, that... It really uh, irritated me. And, you know, I, I'm not a perfectionist, but there are things like that that do crawl under my skin. So, yeah, I have two copies of Volume 5 now. But other than that, um, the other volumes I had, Volume 6 through 12, which I bought in this weird, in this big collection case, um, those... Those were printed fine, no issues similar to that to what I've seen in Volume Five. No issues with the short stories either. So obviously, Kodansha probably heard about that error and probably probably did some uh, had a prepared for it just in case it happened again, which it didn't, and I'm glad. Now the third story arc, the Infinity arc, which they which the Deathbusters are the villains. That's when they introduce Sailor Neptune, Uranus, and at the very end, Sailor Saturn. Now most be now most Sailor fans know that Sailor Uranus, Haruka, and Sailor Neptune, Michiru, are um, are lesbians. Uh yes. 
And for some reason, when it aired on Toonami, they thought the best countermeasure was uh, cousins in the anime. Oh, good job. Anyway, uh, what I really liked about um, about how they handled that uh, those characters is that when um, when they showed Haruka, everyone thought he was a du- uh, Haruka was a dude, just like they did in the anime, but. Early on, he was actually drawn to look like a dude. Um, and it was a pretty convincing look. Um, other than the, other than the uh, suits that uh, Haruka was wearing, they kind of changed his face a little. They gave him a more masculine chin. Yeah, I know I know how, you know, most of the characters, my male characters in Sailor Moon are designed, but I was I could distinct from male and female with them, uh, even with that uh, very Bashibi-ish art style. But... I was like, "Holy crap! Harko looks like a, a dude." But when she, but when the when, when the cat was out of bag and Sailor Uranus is uh, introduced, they they did refeminize her appearances later on. But yeah, the, uh, um, that was some that was some that uh, that uh, that I really wanted to commend the uh, artist for. Now, they were those sailors, uh, and, and I forgot how, if they even explained how Sailor Pluto was alive again, I thought Sailor Pluto was gonna be, like, a Sailor Scout that already, that, that came to be, like, uh, when I thought she was gonna be reunited with Chibi Usa, I thought she wouldn't recognize her, but, because she was actually not the same Sailor Pluto, that was probably someone of the past, but it turns out that this Sailor Pluto does recognize her, and it's the same one that did sacrifice herself uh, to prevent the catastrophe, and you know made Sailor Chibi Moon came to be and all that. Um, they 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 were they're part of the Outer Scouts from a distant area, and they were and apparently the villains, the Deathbusters, who now have a high, who now have an academy school built in their in the center of the Juban district. I wouldn't say center, but they, it's in the Juban district, uh, Mugen Academy, and they infiltrate and try to take the enemy out. However, they were reluctant on the idea of working together with the other existing Sailor Guardians because their methods were slightly more extreme. They're trying to prevent the return of Sailor Saturn, um, who is Hotaru to Moe. Their method was, they gotta kill her before she becomes Sailor Saturn. Sailor Moon's like, no, there has to be a way, I can't believe you did this. And the, and Sailor Uranus is like, you see, this is why we can't work together. But eventually, um, Sailor Saturn did come to be. Now, the interesting th- part about Hotaru is that she's the daughter of Professor Tomoe, who, Soichi Tomoe, I believe that's his name, um, who was a renowned scientist who basically got kicked out by every other scientist because his ex- his projects were a little bit on the extreme side. And he was working on something, and then a fire accident occurred which killed his mother and severely wounded Hotaru. Hotaru now has a, a cyb- is basically has a cyborg body, or, or most of her body parts are cybernetic. And when they reveal that... Uh... Her skin, like her, the limbs on her skin, looked very. They look pretty burnt, and you see the insides, which I believe they're just uh, machi- they're machinations, but it just looked so bizarrely grotesque. Uh, I'm not. I, I'll, I'll give Naruto Takeuchi this much credit. She doesn't have to rely on a lot of blood and gore to make some creepy imagery. Because, uh, but she can make some creepy things. Uh, I remember there was this one nightmare sequence Usagi had that had uh, Mamoru melting before her, and char- certain characters like uh, when they die, they usually get dis- most of the time they just get disintegrated. And before you see them fully disintegrate, they just they just look like they just you can actually see them burning and shit, and. It's it's some it's some interesting stuff and in the Death Buses arc specifically, they had in, they had monsters. I believe they were the Diamonds. I'm not uh, again like it's been like a few days since since I uh, this is the first time I read the Sailor Moon manga. So sometimes my memory's not that fresh up. But 
I believe they were the diamonds. I'm not sure, but uh, they were hidden inside human beings uh, who were manipulated by certain by teachers of the Mugen Academy, who are actually members of the uh, Witches Five. And when and when they actually like get themselves out of human beings, they look like these big, fat, ugly, puss-covered monster insects. They were pretty nightmarish to look at, and, you know, I don't think they existed in the anime at all, and I'm like, damn, why didn't they go with that? But, and, and, uh, Hotaru's dad himself, he's not a possessed man, um, who just ends up working for Master Pharaoh 90. In the manga, he's just, he's fucking evil, through and through. And he mutate he voluntarily mutates himself into a monster called Germatoid, and he dies. Yeah. Which, yeah, <laughs> he was a dick. Uh, they uh, the anime definitely lessened the blow on that character for sure. But Hotaru came to realization that he died long before the, all that shit happened, anyways. And the thing I missed about um, Soichi is this is just a minor nit- nitpick, but in the anime they actually obscured his face with glasses. And he had a creepy smile. Like, his face is all shadowed, except for his glasses and the weird Chester smile that he has. In the manga, he he had no really secret identity, no reason to look like that. So they just showed him how he was when they first introduced him. Which is, you know, a scientist with glasses. And he's got a creepy, uh... He's got a creepy eye on on the right... He's got a creepy-looking right eye, which is the symbol of the germatoid. So, yeah. So, not much else to say other than the fact that Sailor Moon turns into Super Sailor Moon. Um, big fight happens with the villain. I believe they fought off a... They, I think they... Yeah, Pharaoh 90. They came from a far-off system called the Tau, Tau Star System. Sailor Saturn was revived. She uses her attack, which was a mistranslation... Her attack, they called it the Death Ribbon Revolution. Now, while I remember in the Sailor Moon Another Story video game, her attack did look like a wave of ribbons hitting the enemy, the attack is supposed to be called Death Reborn Revolution because she is the Sailor Guardian of Death and Rebirth. And that's actually her fate at the end of the series. She, um, she tries to end the world. Sailor Moon kind of like fixes it anyways like i said shit things escalate in sailor moon every story arc just goes that crazy level escalation but basically at the end of the day the world is saved and hotaru self becomes a baby and haruka mishiru and setsuna uh uranus neptune and pluto respectively raise her as a kid as she rapidly ages and the next arc the dream arc she actually rapidly aged to around Chibi Usa's supposed physical looking age, uh, which, I don't know, like six, seven, eight. But she ends up being a fully grown Sailor Saturn at the start of the, uh, 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 at the, um, at the dream arc anyways. Now the dream arc, which got adapted into the anime Sailor Moon Super S, which is considered to be the weakest of the seasons. I'll tell you this much, in the manga, way, 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 way. Better than the anime. For starters, while Chibiusa, aka Sailor Chibi Moon, has a little more focus, the other Sailor uh, Guardians don't take uh, far off. They don't sit in the far back of the bus in this one. They do get some focus. In fact, each Sailor Guardian actually has a chapter specific focus on their dreams and stuff. Um, that, that was something, something I needed to mention a little bit about uh, regarding the chapter format. Um, the chapters themselves, while the, they're, they're pretty freaking long. If you re- read the table of contents and you see only like five, five chapters in a manga, you're like, wow, that's, that's actually, that, that doesn't sound like a lot, but they're like 50 pages a chapter. Um, they're pretty lengthy and each chapter actually had, uh, for the first few, um, for the first few, uh, uh, chapters, each each one actually had an interesting title uh, because they would say they would say you know something something this comma a character focus like 
um, for example, chapter two is Ami Mizuno, comma, Sailor Mercury. So, you know, from the chapter, it's going to be like, oh, it's about Sailor Mercury. And they do this again for the Black Moon arc. I don't know what the chapters, specific, chapters are named specifically, but they will always say something, something, comma, Sailor Mars, Sailor Mercury, or even the villain, like Revelation, Death Phantom. Um, then they got changed to something else in Dream Arc, but you would know that the chapter would be something, uh, would be a little more character focused. Um, and they, and each of the, uh, sailor guardians did get some focus. Uh, so that's a good thing. And again, the story arc did not feel completely dragged. Uh, the Amazon trio were basically wiped out instantly. Like they show up. They, they, well, first off they were animals of the Amazonist quartet, which are the villains above them. And they were, yeah, they were just animals, but then they decide to turn them into humans, and then they just have them concoct their own individual plans. And they get taken out pretty quickly, as you would expect. And the Amazonist Quartet themselves, uh, interesting revelation, they are also Sailor Guardians as well. Um, so I thought that was a pretty shocking revelation, and it would explain something about a video game I'm currently playing. Somebody made a fan-made sequel to Sailor Moon Another Story, and it's called Sailor Moon Another Story 2, and it basically covers everything else about Sailor Moon, including Super S and Sailor Stars. And I just remember looking at some of the screen caps and noticing some of the, uh, some of the unusual-looking Sailor Guardians that kind of looked, that did remind me of the Amazon's Quartet, and it turns out that they were just, you know, they, they were Sailor Guardians who were basically under the main villain Nehalena's influence. So that was that was um a twist. They do show up again um in the Sailor Stars arc, so they have some relevance. And the Sailor Stars arc, wow. Um they, they, they it's 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 how you would expect some it would it would be it would it's something you would expect out of a final story arc anyways. Uh, it reminds me of the story, final story arc to Kaneko Man, which I haven't seen, but Big Al told me about a few times. Uh, it turns out there were other people who were, um, who were like heirs to the throne of, uh, who, who claimed to be heirs to the throne of, you know, being the king of, I think the plant was Plant Kaneko or something. And they all look like Kaneko Man and they have a tournament. Spoiler alert, Kaneko Man wins. Um... So basically, there are other Sailor Guardians, and one of them is fucking evil, and and is wiping out other Sailor Guardians inside the other cos cosmos, and even creating her own villain group called the Anima Mates, who are like people who claim to be Sailor Guardians, but they're really not. And they had some really goofy names at this point. They're not named. I don't know if they were named after planets, but I never heard of an Iron Mouse before because that was the first villain, Sailor Iron Mouse. And it's the darkest of the arcs, and the, uh, the, the, the unlike the anime, the Sailor Guardians did not die in the Dark Moon Kingdom arc. They were critically injured, but they did not flat out die. I heard Naoko Tekuchi wanted them to die dramatic deaths at the end of the arc, but the editors told her not, no, but she was baffled when the anime adaptation did the exact same thing she wanted them wanted to do in the first place. But in this final story arc, they do die. Well, first they say that their 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 crystals, um, inside them were taken away. And, but but then but then the sailor stars who are who are introduced in this series, I uh, the star healer maker and fighter. Yeah, those were the three. They, they say that they, they, they just fly out, say at one point, yeah, your friends are dead. But, but before that, they were like, their bodies vanish. And I forgot what they, I forgot what they called it. Son of a bitch. Hold on. Their sailor crystals were taken after their bodies were extinguished. Their, their Chris, their souls, which are embodied in these little crystals got taken by Galaxia. Um, that's what they were called. But they just flat out said, uh, but the, the Sailor Stars, they just flat out said, yeah, they're dead. <laughs> they're dead, but you gotta go try and rescue them anyways. About the Sailor Stars themselves. 
Uh, in the anime, they were dudes who transformed into girls. In the manga, they were just girls disguised as boys. Specifically, some pop idol group. Um, I believe they were called Starlight something. But yeah. Uh, it, they're pretty much all three just basically Haruka again. Except they actually want to keep... Instead of just looking masculine, they just happen to, you know, disguise themselves as dudes. That's... That's actually something I heard Tekauchi was kind of shocked by uh, regarding the anime adaptation anyways. Um, so, yeah, it was a pretty dark arc. Um, it even, it even like, almost teased you that it could be a really disappoint- depressing ending because all the events that were happening in Crystal Tokyo, things were, bad things were happening. People were vanishing and shit. And when Tuxedo Masks' crystal got thrown into the cauldron, extinguished him permanently, Saber Chimu just upped and vanished. So they were basically teasing that this could very well be at the end and history could be rewritten. Um, however, um, with the help of Sailor Chibi Chibi, this, en- this enigmatic character that's like more petite looking than Sailor uh, than Chibi Usa. She shows up. She doesn't talk much. They don't, nobody knows a dang thing about her, but except that she's just a really nice individual. It turns out that she is also a sailor guardian herself, uh, called Sailor Cosmos, who just had a really, who just really could not stand living through the shit that was going down. Um, Galaxia was actually under orders by a, just an entity who calls himself Chaos. Um, yeah. Which is kind of disappointing, because I thought Galaxia would be the head villain, because, you know, they revealed her pretty early and all that. But, no, she's just taken orders by another enigmatic big bad villain who's masked in the shadows like everyone else. And this one is apparently above all the other ones. Metalia, Nehalena, Massifera 90, and um, the Death Phantom. But... It end, uh, but there was a happy ending, a little uh, kinda. They said that uh, they said that he, uh, if the way the ending was made, they say that chaos could return. Chaos could return, but it basically ended with the marriage of um, Usagi and uh, Chiba. Then uh, I liked it. Uh, had no issues with it. Um, it, 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 Sailor Moon. You know, it really is hard for me to hate on this series. Um, I really do hope that that new anime adaptation does show up, and it does show up soon. Um, the short stories. I had no idea these existed, but Kodansha released two short story compilations, and I was like, well, dude, there's more? Shit, I just bought the only, the, the remaining uh, ten volumes, man. Well, I picked those up too, and... They're not really necessary to read, but they're still pretty entertaining to read, and I would still, you know, recommend the hell out of them. Uh, especially Volume 2, which has the Princess Kaguya story. Um, but the but the first volume had a few uh, Sailor Chibi Moon adventures, but what I really liked about those is that some of them, no, two of them actually, uh, Sailor V returned. Which, you know, doesn't make sense, but I don't care. Sailor V... Uh, Minako got in her Sailor V costume alongside Sailor Moon. And I thought that was just pretty cool imagery right there. Um, they ha- and, and it's not... And they're not just plain old filler stories. They actually do try... They do feel like Sailor Moon chapters themselves in quality. Because a villain does show up and, you know... Sailor Moon and or her guardians do show up to save the day. Uh, there was one villain who was trying to like um, absorb energy from a dent from a dentistry. And then there was another one who was actually a vampire. It has something to do with f- the vampire itself. Apparently has a fond. The vampires in Sailor Moon apparently they are still blood sucking creatures, but they have a fondness for flowers. The story arc that I found pretty hilarious was the one that focused specifically on Ami. Uh, she was basically, you know, doing mock exams in order to get herself ready for an entrance exam for high school. Um, but she kept getting perfect scores. However, uh, alongside her, some mysterious figure named Mercurius 
I think that's how you pronounce it. It's supposed to be Latin for Mercury. Uh, ends up getting the exact same scores, and this just irritates Ami to no end. And um, and just a little bit of hilarity ensued. Um, and one episode, she, uh, one scenario is that she exhausts herself to the point where she had to be hospitalized. But then the like the uh, but then the mon- the monster of the of that story or, uh, of that chapter showed up. And she thought that she 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 just wanted to know who this individual was, he or she. Um, the other sailor, uh, the other sailor guardians do find out who it is. It's just some geeky kid who's friends with another geeky kid in the uh, in the manga itself, Umino. Um, you might you you he's also in the anime as well, but um, and he he himself also looked geeky, but they. <laughs> They basically tell uh, Ami a, a, a different story that he actually looked a little more Bashonen, like a very young Albert Einstein, because that was that was basically a, per, a person that Ami herself could see her be with. Somebody who was like Albert Einstein when they had that little girly talk discussion. Now, Volume Two only had three chapters, but like I said before, the 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 first chapter was the Princess Kaguya arc which I believe was adapted into one of the films, Sailor Moon S, which is actually the best movie out of the three. Um, this one, this story arc was very Luna-centric, and I really enjoyed it. Um, definitely felt like a long movie when you actually pick it up and read it. Um, but there's just one little thing I just want to talk about real quick. I can suspend my disbelief on a lot of things. Um... You know, the whole magic, the the past lives, the future Crystal Tokyo, and the fact that everyone had, like, a, a millennium-long lifespan in Crystal Tokyo. I could believe all that crap. But one thing that really bugged me is that in one scene... But in one scene, Kekiru flies over to, um, uh, to NASA in the United States, and Luna follows him. Um, how does she do this? Magic? Teleportation? No, you know how she does it? She gets onto the wing of an airplane and just sits there as the airplane is flying from Japan to America, not getting pushed off and getting fa- falling to her death and probably not suffering from severe hearing problems because when she you know meets Kakeru again, she understands and listens to everything he says. But she just flies on the freaking pl- wing of a plane. And in true Twilight Zone fashion, uh, there was a little girl who seen this and sees this and goes, Mommy, Mommy, there's a cat on the plane. And the mom's not paying attention. It's like, shut up and stop, stop, making, uh, stop saying stupid things. But I'm serious, Mommy. I was just like, wow. Th- that really just broke it for me. But other than that, it was a really good story arc. Um... See why they would save this as a final volume. This 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 is definitely worth a read, um, especially around the holiday season. The last two chapters, I really can't say much. Like one chapter is like takes place in the future where um, Usagi's chi- where the children of the sailor inner guardians who oddly have the same names and look all look like younger versions of them anyways, as well as um, Ko Usagi. Uh, eh, not much I can say about that. It's just there for comedic purposes. And, wow, they were really, they were severe dicks to, um, Usaki's daughter. They really were. Um, but, af- but, uh, but other than that, um, it, it was a great read. Uh, I would recommend picking up volume two solely just for that first story arc. What else can I talk about? Um, nothing else really. Um, Eternal Sailor Moon's design looks really awesome. It's basically Sailor Moon with a rainbowish skirt, puffy sleeves, and wings. That's that's a, that, that's definitely a step up. At least she isn't growing her hair to be fifty foot long and shaved eyebrows like Goku did that part. I could buy I could buy the long hair, but the, the shaved eyebrow thing. Um, anyways, uh, the uh, one part that made me laugh but really didn't add anything was that the Amazon's quartet saw uh, 
played a little spell trick on both uh, Usagi and Chibiusa, have them switch physical appearances, but it really didn't add nor subtract anything. It, it really, it, they just, it, it just, it, it was almost like they did it just for lols, but they haven't. Re- but it, it just really didn't add anything to a devious plot or something. Um, let's see, Tuxedo Mask. Um, his costume uh, is still the same, except the eye holes are cut out, which means his identity was easily revealed anyways. Any other little notes I can mention? Uh, Sailor Jupiter is still my favorite. even uh, And her attacks, even though she has some lightning, her attacks seem to be more uh, earth and plant-based. Um, hmm. Oh, yeah, um... In the early, um, in the very first chapter of Sailor Moon, when uh, Usagi finally transformed, I don't know if she had the cape on, but some of the promo art did show her with a cape, uh, white on the outside, red on the inside. But she also had a mask that's very similar to Sailor V's, except it's white. And it actually had a, a special ability. She was able to like use it as something of a like magic camera. Um, she was able to know where the trouble, that there was some danger brewing at the, uh, the, uh, I think it's called the OSAP or OSAP, her friend's jewelry store that her friend's mother owns. She was able to see the danger through that, that way. And she never uses the mask again until like much, much later, sometime around the R arc. And then it just gets dropped altogether. The art style is how I expected. Looks pretty similar to the anime I watched. Um, definitely had some comic relief, even though storylines were pretty fast-paced and things got serious. And the, the art style did reflect off of that. Um, pretty simplified art style, too. Um, except when he puts details to, you know, decaying bodies. Hmm... Like I said, a few translation issues, I mentioned them before, but it, it's not something that, you know, I'm going to lose my shit over. At least not compared to the screw-up they did with Volume Five's inking. So yeah, uh, Sailor Moon. Really love this manga. Uh, if I didn't, I wouldn't finish reading it. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I would recommend it uh, if, you, if you were a fan of the anime. It's definitely worth checking out. I also recommend that you re- pick up Codename Sailor V. Especially, it's best to read that first before you um, before you actually read the Sailor Moon because it's an interesting starter series uh, of you know how things came to be, as as well as the origin of the Sailor V game, which which was pretty important in the first few chapters of Sailor Moon since it was something of a training device, and there happens to be a command sender. Uh, yeah, a command center located under the, uh, the the Sailor Moon arcade game, inside the uh, the Crown Game Center, and the guy who basically runs it, Matoki, he he actually does eventually find out that Usagi, Minako, and everyone else is Sailor Moon, Sailor V, and the other Guardians. Um, yeah, they I think they reveal that either at the start of the. Uh, of the Black Moon or at the end of the Dark Kingdom arc. And he kind of disappears after that. He really, I don't remember seeing him uh, much after that anyways. In fact, they don't really, you know, the only people who actually go to the command center much were Artemis and Luna. So, yeah, those are some of my thoughts. I know they're probably not every single thought I had, but this is enough to do for about an hour long video. Um, my future, my next video will be my uh, Ikitosin Great Guardians review. Hopefully, I will have that out sometime during the New Year's, and um, I might get. I, I, I'm pro- I'm definitely gonna get that Ike review after my Mystery and Memo review. Yeah, it, people are voting, and it's Agent Ika. The votings have stopped. If you do go in there and vote Labyrinth of Flames, I I, I might change my mind, but. <laughs> Either way, both shows are extremely heavy in fan service, but I'm going to have to watch Agent Ica again now. Unless, of course, people actually go back to that old video and start casting their votes, but it doesn't look like it's going to be that way. In the meantime, uh, I found this huge 20-disc complete set of almost everything Robotech, and I'm going to watch more episodes of Robotech and some of the bonus features behind that. 
as well as finishing up Macross Frontier. No, I have no plans to review either of those, at least not yet. But, you know, and then sometime around the New Year's, I'll actually get around to watch, watching Nikki Tosin and have that re- prepped and reviewed. And, um, and I may ha- pump out a video or two in between. Magus, if you remember him, and if you're sub to him, is now telling some stories. And he did his story of uh, a little interesting story about how a D&D game went to shit. I'm going to post a link in the bo- uh, description below so you guys can check it out. But it basically encouraged me to want me to tell a story. But like I said, that will have to wait between these uh, next set of days. But if I do get 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 it out by then, awesome. But yeah, there you go. Um, Sailor Moon, the manga. I love it. I freaking love it. It's definitely one of my top favorite mangas to read. With that said, Dark Scream 217 signing out. Oh yeah, and a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Robonica, Stardica, and whatever ho- uh, holiday you celebrate around this time, and a Happy New Year. Take care, everybody.